We all know we're supposed to sleep well, eat healthy and stay fit to manage stress. We have to raise kids with confidence, love our spouse and figure tough things out, no pouting or losing our cool. With more yoga classes, cookbooks, self-help gurus and hippie approved herbal supplements than ever before, the big question is, why do we keep getting sick, fat, stuck and fed up? This podcast has the answers. My name is Tira Warner, and if you're ready for straight talk on women's health, then welcome to Wish Radio. The interview you're about to listen to was recorded as part of a series on wild and sustainable living. The interview is conducted by Allison Ramsey, and it is with Daniel Vitalis. This is a super inspiring interview that really summarizes Daniel's position on rewilding and gives loads of inspiration and explanations for why we've come so far off track from healthier, happy living. I hope you enjoy this call. We are all driven to become the best version of ourselves. And to do this, we think we need to try out the latest and greatest bad diets, fashions, products, superfoods, and even pharmaceutical drugs that promise to enhance our health and happiness. As we surf the net on our iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks, looking for the answers to love, life, and an end to loneliness, deep in our DNA and just outside our door, quietly ever-present, is an answer to health, vitality, and interconnectedness. Time and time again, the beauty, wonder, and power of nature inspires and heals us physically and spiritually. It teaches inner calm, perspective, and brings us a feeling of well-being. It speaks to the wild nature that is inside of us. But in a world where technology reigns and the dollar is king, in a consumer-driven world where nature cannot be bought and bottled and sold, so is therefore largely forgotten, we experience a great disconnect from this wildness. But thankfully, there are people out there like my next guest who have made it their life passion to shed new light on old wisdom and help us to understand again why we should switch off, unplug, ditch the fancy footwear, and honor the rhythms cycles, and elements of nature to reawaken that wild creature that resides in us all. He is one of the most sought-after speakers today and is featured in the amazing film Hungry for Change. I am honored and excited to welcome Daniel Vitalis. Daniel, thank you so much for being here to get a little wild with us today. Hey, and it's great to be here, and I really love that introduction. Great, thank you. So I know you have gone really deep in your exploration of rewilding and have a lot of amazing knowledge to share, but let's just begin at the beginning with a bit of an introduction into rewilding. What is rewilding and why is it something we should consider doing to enhance our long-term health? You know, it's so interesting when we think about ourselves as a species, you know, human beings, we tend to get into a mindset like we, you know, we are visitors on planet Earth and, and like we're not really as much a part of it as we are observers here visiting or even exploiting the Earth, but not so much part of it, not the same way that the other animals are, not the same way that the plants are and the fungi are and the microbes are. It's almost like we, we have an us or them mentality. Now, the reality is, I think, when we look at ourselves more objectively for a moment, we see there's a lot of similarity between us us and all the other organisms of the planet. Like, it's not hard to see the resemblance between ourselves and maybe some of those relatives of ours, the great apes, and we can see these tremendous differences, but we also see that there's a lot of similarity. And we see that our needs are very similar to so many of the other species, particularly the mammals. And again, as we move toward those primate animals, so similar. We see that we need the same kind of foods and we need the same kind of environmental factors. And we, we're, we're born from our mother's womb and we nurse from our mother's breast and we're raised in community and we're, we're so similar in so many ways. And it's, it's almost as if in, in order to prove our difference, we've 
divorced ourselves more and more from nature over time as time's gone on. And we're at this point today where we are frantically trying to figure out a solution to our diminishing health, not just physical health, but also our emotional health and our psychological health. And we're frantically looking for cures and answers, and we're willing to take extreme measures in order to try to find, reestablish that homeostasis, that balance we're looking for. Uh, but we keep looking in the places that we've been looking. We keep looking to things that divorce us further and further from nature. So we keep trying more drugs, different drugs, newer drugs. We explore new ways to slash and burn our bodies in a hope to cut away what's bad, you know, what's what's hurting. Mm. We explore more and more ways to augment ourselves. We isolate ourselves more and more from nature. We seal our houses up more. We climate control more. We remove ourselves more and more and isolate ourselves more and more, not just from the natural world, but even from each other. And rewilding is sort of a different approach. It says, hey, wait a second. We come from the natural world. We may not remember it very well, but it's where we come from. And mm-hmm. even just a walk out in the forest on a trail brings us a kind of inner contentment and joy and a sense of belonging that um, nurtures something in us that a lot of us have lost. And rewilding says, hey, maybe the path back to health, back to happiness, back to psychological health, has something to do with us re-entering the natural world again and beginning to honor and respect our needs for nature and the things, the food, the water, the air, the sunlight that comes from nature. So rewilding is, for me, what it is, is it's an approach, it's a strategy, it's a, a path toward health that believes in and respects the natural way for humans rather than... Um, um, gushing over technological quick fixes. Mm, yeah, that's great. And you also talk a lot about domestication and what has happened to us since we've divorced ourselves from nature. I know it's been a long process. But can you tell us a little bit more about how you view human domestication? Yeah, I mean, domestication is, for me, probably one of my, it's one of my, I've got a lot of passions in this life, but one is this study and trying to understand this thing we call domestication. Um, a lot of us have heard that word domicile, and it means home. And the word domestication is a Latin word, it means of the house. And we use it to describe species who have been altered or changed from their natural form to a form that's um, sort of under human control, or sometimes even truly of the house, like things we've brought into our house. The, the great example is our domesticated dog, and, and the reason is because all of the domesticated dogs around the world, you know, it's not just here in the United States or just in the developed Western world that we have dogs, but we find domesticated dogs, when the, when the colonists arrived here in the New World, um, they found domesticated dogs here amongst the tribes. Um, when we went up and found the Inuit people, they were living with domesticated dogs. And the same was true in Africa and South America. We find all around the world, man's best friend has truly been man's best friend, but all of those dogs come from gray wolves. The only difference, you know, technically science sees them as the same species, but the only difference is the domesticated dog is of the house. It's been changed because its environment's changed and its food's changed, and that's changed its behaviors. And over time, as they were bred and bred and bred, we've ended up with a distinctly different subspecies of gray wolf called Canis lupus similiaris, the, the, the common dog. Now, this has also happened with cows who come from a, a gigantic wild beast called the auroch. It's happened to sheep who were once rams. It's uh, happened to goats who were once mountain goats. It's happened to our pigs who were once boars. And I could go on and on. There are many species mm-hmm. which have become domesticated, and that's true of plants as well. Now, this process changes us to be more suited to a controlled environment. And human beings were probably really the first domesticated species. We changed ourselves first and in that process started changing other species. And what we kind of did was, you know, we hear that idea of survival of the fittest. Um, And, you know, it doesn't mean who can run the fastest. That's not what it means at all. In fact, Darwin said, uh, really, survival of the fittest was about who was quickest to adapt. And we adapt to our environment and all the things in our environment. 
And because we've lived in a kind of artificially created human reality for a long time now, we've adapted to an almost artificial world, and that's why so many of us struggle to get back to the natural world, because we're almost more fit for living in hotel rooms than we are for mm-hmm. living in nature. Now, yeah. just <laughs> it's funny, but you know, a lot of us are a lot more comfortable when we've got the air conditioning on and we're wearing clothes and we're in a comfy recliner and we're watching HBO with our feet up <laughs> than we would be out on a trail somewhere. Um, yeah. Or maybe without a trail somewhere. And I'm one of those people, so I speak from experience. Um, <laughs> wh- you know, just like we can find the what we call the wild progenitor of the dog, so we know that the, the dog comes from this wild organism, the progenitor of it, the wolf, we can find a, a wild progenitor of human. And these are the aboriginal peoples of the world or the indigenous peoples of the world, the tribal hunter-gatherer peoples who lived basically everywhere around the world except the most extreme Arctic climates. I mean, we find our aboriginal ancestors were living everywhere. But they did so without the domestication of plants, without the domestication of animals, without factories, without jobs, without industries. They did that Mm -hmm. living in, in many ways like so many other species of the planet by being enmeshed in the natural world. We have domesticated ourselves and we've left the natural world behind. And many people listening are going to think, well, good, right? Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. <laughs> and in, in many ways, it seems that way. And then we start to observe what we learn from anthropologists, from archaeologists, from our, our paleo um, anthropologists, from the people who study the ancient sites where we can look back into our early history. And here's what emerges. The strangest thing is, when we really started this practice of domestication, and it really ramped up about 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, we, we started with the domestication of wheat. And when we began that process, we see that life changed for us really dramatically. We went from a life that was very free and actually very leisurely, surprisingly leisurely. In fact, it's estimated that the the average indigenous person spends about 12 to 15 hours a week securing their needs, as opposed to us working 40 plus. Um, Mm. But also we see that our bones shrunk and started to be scarred by the lesions of the repetitive stress of the work that we were doing. And we see that our brains actually shrunk So you would think, well, didn't we get smarter when this started? But actually, we see our Mm -hmm. brains got smaller. And one of the real telltale signs is that we started to see damage in our teeth from the malnourishment of our new domesticated diet. Now, here's the thing. This process has been underway for 10,000 years, but it's got a parabolic effect. It's not a long, slow process that just sort of trucks along. It's like so many other processes, much like what population does, We went from early domestication and we trucked along for 10,000 years and then recently the health problems have skyrocketed. It's a parabolic curve. And what we see now is this rampant type of disease that we call degenerative. And we call it degenerative because what we see is that our bodies are degenerating. Our epigenetics are at the genetic level. We're degenerating. And we're degenerating because we're no longer evolving and adapting. We're actually coming unglued. What would be great is if we saw, wow, look how we're changing and adapting to this new lifestyle. But what we see is not that. We see, we, we sort of see that picture painted in our media, but what we see in reality is, is, a, is a rampant degenerative disease. So that could be cancer, that could be um, heart disease, that could be uh, arthritic type conditions of multiple types, that could be all of these un- misunderstood syndromes from myo, you know, fascial pain to, to Lyme's disease. It could be um, diabetic type blood sugar issues. But what we see is that people are going down faster and faster, earlier and earlier from degenerative disease. And it's, it would be short-sighted to look back and say, hey, there wasn't a lot of that 100 years ago. That's true, mm-hmm. but the process really got underway about 10,000 years ago. Hmm. Wow. So what is it, Daniel, that has been the real accelerating factors in this process? Like, you talk about domestication, but what is it about domestication 
um, aside, like diet is a big one, um, and divorcing ourselves from from nature. But can you can you talk a little bit more in detail about the whys of this degeneration? I I, I will, and and let me say this first. My opinion is that. Um, if we remove ourselves from nature, we really truly remove ourselves from the source of all health and all life. And mm. that process of boarding ourselves in, you know, you could almost, I guess, metaphorically imagine a person who starts to shut out everyone who loves that, them and everyone who cares about them and starts and stops eating and stops taking care of themselves and boards themselves in more and more and more. That's what we're doing like as a species. Not only have we divorced ourselves from our connection to the planet itself, I mean, we literally insulate electrically ourselves from the planet with our footwear. We, we've mm-hmm. moved indoors. We've moved out of the sunlight. Not only have we moved out of the sunlight, we've created a cultural meme that says the sun causes cancer. We've moved out of natural air, and we've, we've cut our ties to all the plants and animals who we saw before as our brothers and sisters or as our allies who today we're actually we're, cre- we're, we're actually causing an extinction level event on the planet. So we are um, doing a kind of genocide uh, against all other species. So um, in my opinion, it would be that that is why. But let's break it down a little bit more scientifically. You know, if we were going to say um, what creates or what are the factors that truly affect health, and, you know, I apologize if this seems a little myopic. I know there are many factors that create health, but let's talk about some of the big ones. Um, I would say diet is a very large um, part of it. I would say lifestyle in general is a huge part of health creation. I would say exercise is, a, we know that's a tremendous part of our overall health. Our genetics, of course, are a huge part of our health, right? A lot of factors are genetic. Um, Our Mm -hmm. environmental exposures, the things that we get exposed to, are incredibly important to our health. And, of course, our social structure and our familial structure is really important to our health. So if we just took those few things, right, obviously there are many more. We could flush this out for days, but those, I think, are the real major things. If we were going to look at what's changed, you know, for instance, our diet used to be wild plants and wild animals primarily. We definitely ate fungi, we definitely ate microbes, but primarily we ate from we were hunters and gatherers. So we both hunted wild animals and we gathered wild plants. And those foods contain nutrients and compounds that we don't really see to this day or we see in different ratios in our modern foods. For instance, when we look at wild plants, we see a a radically different ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fats. And so what we find is that once we domesticate a plant, for instance, if we took a a wild um, grain, like a a wild seed from a grass, we would see that it had higher omega-3 fats and lower omega-6 fats than the grains that we eat today, which become very high in omega-6. And the problem is omega-6 fats are inflammatory. And we know that inflammatory conditions underlie most health issues. So what we see is by domesticating the plants, for whatever reason, those plants become more inflammatory. We also see that the wild plants that we used to eat contained flavors that indicated the presence of complex, partially poisonous chemicals, alkaloids, that were in our plants. That today, we, that those flavors are bitter. Honestly, they're bitter flavors. We used to eat foods that contained more bitterness. By breeding that bitterness out through the domestication process, a great example would be our lettuces, which used to be much more bitter. And the wild lettuces are still here. They're still in your backyard for most of the people listening. Um, Mm -hmm. Though you may not recognize them, they're there and they're Mm -hmm. on the side of the road and you drive by them every day if you live in North America. They have very strong bitter flavors because of the compounds that are found in there. Now, those compounds are poisonous, but they're also medicinal, just like all pharmaceutical medicines, which are poisonous but also medicinal. And it's all about the dose. Well, wild plants contained hosts of medicines. To this day, most of our pharmaceuticals are still derived from plants wild plants. Well, we used to eat those, and we would get those medicines in our diet. Today, we've bred them out, so we eat the plants, but they don't contain the medicines anymore. And what ends up happening to us? Well, we we start to have a medicine deficiency. And of course, we're trying to compensate for that by taking pharmaceutical drugs, but they're too unnatural, too unbalanced. And they ultimately create 
horrible imbalances in our bodies. And I don't think I really need to flush that out. I think a lot of the people listening get that pharmaceutical drugging is a, a very dangerous path to go down. And certainly mm-hmm. there are some very tremendous benefits, especially in the emergency setting. But in the long-term mm-hmm. treatment setting, I mean, these things are dangerous. And plants are what we have some 200,000 years of adaptation to. And we see a similar thing with the animals that we used to hunt who had very different types of body fat because those animals ate wild plants, whereas today the animals people eat are eating domesticated grains. And again, they end up accumulating these inflammatory fats and they end up becoming deficient in things that we really need, like the long chain fats, which we build our brain from. And so we find that there's deficiencies in our domesticated diet. Now, again, this has gone parabolic because we started eating that food 10,000 years ago, but we still hunted and gathered. And for a lot of the people listening, your mom probably, I mean, your mom may have gathered herbs and your father may have hunted. I mean, this isn't like a practice that disappeared 10,000 years ago. But Mm -hmm. now we're at a generation where suddenly almost no one does any practices like that anymore. And the food has gone from just being domesticated to being genetically modified. And um, this is leading to health issues that are difficult to trace but profound in their effect. So we, we see a diet today essentially that no longer even resembles the natural diet for our species. And I think it's obvious to anybody listening, if we were to take a wild animal and radically alter its diet, we would expect to see some negative effects because it's it's adapted to that diet. So we're not eating the diet we were adapted to. When we domesticated ourselves, we changed our lifestyle. We were actually semi-nomadic people. Human beings were not what we call sedentary. So we became sedentary when we started domesticating things because prior to that, what we would do is we would eat up all the food in an area and then we would go to another area and eat up all the food there and wait for the food to grow back in the other area. And we would, most people would have a sort of circuit that they did. It wasn't like they wandered endlessly. They would have a circuit that they did. And they would go from sort of camp to camp, season to season, eating up the food there and then allowing it to regenerate. And they actually had amazing processes to ensure that more grew back than what they took. So it was a beautiful thing. When we started domesticating, we started farming. And that meant we stopped moving, and we became what we call sedentary peoples. And we went from having a lifestyle where everybody was very equal to one that became hierarchical because the creation of surplus foods meant that there had to be somebody to rule over those foods. And the ruling over those foods created the kind of hierarchies that we see now today. It also created a priest class and eventually a disciplinary kind of class, like the policing Mm -hmm. class. And so we, our lifestyle has changed dramatically from a tribal one where we moved to a sedentary one, which is run through hierarchical modes of control. So that has had a tremendous effect on our health. Another piece would be the exercise piece because everybody was active and not because they were working out, right? So when we look at indigenous people, a fascinating thing about undomesticated people is that they have the muscle mass of our Olympic athletes. Now, they don't train for that. <laughs> they don't have a they don't have like a hunter gatherer gym they go to. They simply live outside. They simply live outside and their their daily practices of securing their needs, even though they work far less than we've ever worked and have far less stresses than we have and have far better teeth and bones than we have, they still don't have to do very much to maintain the muscle mass of our Olympic athletes. As opposed to us, who what we do is we actually work to store up money that we then spend on food that we eat, and then we pay to go to a gym to try to burn off the calories that we ate because we didn't need them. <laughs> it's, like a cra- it's a crazy cycle um, where we we essentially um, – we, we not only do we have to um, find some artificial way to train ourselves today because of our lifestyle, um, we have to find artificial ways of exercising, but we typically choose forms of exercise that are more punishing than they are rewarding. And so for mm-hmm. a lot of people out there, um, they they go through their exercise begrudgingly. Um, mm-hmm. And it's unfortunate because I, I see exercise personally as training, and so it's sad to see that people um, train themselves into unhappiness <laughs> very yeah. often. And of course, we've seen... Yeah. 
we've seen that change with the emergence of sort of more like yoga and more CrossFit and more things that people are passionate about, and that's been great. But, but of course, you know, artificial exercise, you know, we see, um, if, I don't know if you've ever seen the amazing images of a, of a chimpanzee with no hair, but the muscle no. mass is shocking. It's shocking how muscular yeah. they are. And they don't, yeah. you know, lift weights and they don't need to. So they another fact. Say again? They don't run on the treadmill. They don't run on treadmills, exactly. Or, you know, and I think <laughs> of the treadmill as sort of, you know, I mean, it is a lot like, you know, the wheel that you put in the mouse cage, right? It's a yeah. a road to nowhere. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, it's an interesting. It's a metaphor, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it's, it is. It's, it's almost beyond. It's like it's poignant, you know, it, running mm running to nowhere, all of that work expended but no nothing accomplished, if that makes sense. So if you think about yeah. the work, the exercise that an aboriginal person would do, um, every f- expenditure of energy would yield something produced as opposed to, you know, all that energy of running on the treadmill but not actually getting anywhere. All that work lifting things but not actually having put anything together. Uh, is really, <laughs> I think it's poignant. I think it's unfortunate. Yeah. So uh, a couple more factors. Um, you know, one would be our genetics. Um, and I think ultimately that's what we see with domestication. You know, genetics are a huge factor in our health. Now, we as a species share a genome, but each individual has a unique epigenome. And the epigenome is the information that rides along with your genome, like a little sidecar of data that f- it flicks on genetic switches and flicks off genetic switches. And your epigenome is heavily influenced by the food you eat, by the food your mom ate and your dad ate, by the food that your grandmother and grandfather ate, heavily affected out about three generations. And, Mm -hmm. um, of course, what we see is that uh, there's been a tremendous lifestyle shift in the last 10,000 years, but it's really accelerated in the last couple generations. Mm -hmm. So today, what we see and we hear about so many genetic illnesses. Now, what I want the listener to know is that most of these genetic illnesses, what ends up happening to somebody is, yes, they have a gene that predisposes them to the potential for a type of illness, but It's up to them whether or not that gene gets expressed. How you live, what you eat, environmental factors, how you exercise determines if that gene will get expressed or not get expressed. So if somebody has a gene that predisposes them to breast cancer, they do not have to go get the Angelina Jolie double mastectomy. They simply have to live a lifestyle that doesn't turn those genes on. And, I mean, it's a tremendously sad thing to see the level of slashing and burning people will go to, Mm -hmm. the augmentation, because they don't know that they have some control over the expression of genes in their body. Instead, we've almost been convinced our body is attacking us or waging war against us or Mm -hmm. like as if you're not your body and your body is Mm -hmm. this separate thing fighting you. It's it's very sad. So um, we have really altered our, our our genetics through this process of domestication, but we also still have a tremendous measure of control. Um, The next piece, I would say environmental exposures. Um, I just did a little research on this before the call because I I wanted to offer a little insight uh, into environmental exposures. If you imagine, let's say we go back to the world of the Native American uh, tribal person pre-1492. I don't want to give the impression, I don't want to sound... Uh, utopic, like I think that the people uh, who were, you know, living here in the Americas prior to um, the era of Columbus had some perfect life. I understand that they they didn't, but compared to us today, they did in many ways. One way would be that they lived in a world of old growth forest, waterfalls, clean rivers, clean rain, no chemicals, healthy soils. No deforestation, no no erosion, no runoff, no chemical exposure. They lived in a perfectly clean environment. We can't even imagine it today. And it's going to be a long time before anyone can imagine it again. Uh, we've mm-hmm. altered our landscape so much so that um, geologists today are calling our current era the Anthropocene era. And it means that we've changed the Earth so dramatically that it will be seen in the layers by future archaeologists. So we have wow. altered our landscape and we've, we've released, concentrated, um, reacted and released um, nuclear radiation, nuclear um, nucleotides 
at a level that just is almost unimaginable. And that's going to be here for a long time. Um, but interestingly, we in the United States currently have 85,000 registered chemicals in commerce. 85,000 <laughs> new man-made registered chemicals in commerce, and we add 2,000 every year. Now, oh do, does anyone entertain the idea that we know what all these chemicals do in our bodies over time or what the interactions of these different chemicals? I think we all know that we don't know. And we are mm-hmm. just haphazardly really sort of creating and releasing things. And what we end up finding out about um, these chemicals, when what we end up learning uh, is that they're bad for us, but we learn it in retrospect. So we find out, oh, BPA, wow, it appears that... Uh, bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor and that it destroys fertility and that it creates tumors and cancers in the reproductive systems of men and women. But, oh, sorry, it's in almost everything in your house. Oops. (laughs) Right? So rather than anybody stopping to ask the question first, what we do is we rush it through. And, you know, a lot of us could say, oh, the Congress should have, you know, that it's the chemical industry, it's this, it's, it's, but we're buying the stuff. And so ultimately, really, the, a lot of the power resides with us. You know, we vote with our dollars. Mm-hmm. But, but my Definitely. point is, is that the Native American person, the Aboriginal of Australia, the Anu person of Japan, they were not dealing with chemical exposures the way that we are. So that's had a tremendous effect on our health. We've changed our world. We had a very utopic world, and now we have a, a almost, um, well, we have a dystopic world, and we have to learn how to really deal with that and create strategies to deal with it. And the last piece I want to give on this is our social structure. We went from a world of um, tribal interconnectedness. And again, I know, I, know that this, I know that tribes warred with each other. I know that things were not perfect. But the difference between our world today and the world that we were from, we, we lived in a tribal setting. We had elders who were wise. Mm-hmm. We had many, many generations of people that we would be enmeshed in. We would be enmeshed in many generations, young people beneath us and older people, wise people above us, and we would move through that from our early stages to our older elder stages through the life cycle enmeshed in a tribal setting. Then what we did was we became sedentary and we created larger villages and we created hierarchical structures and we created... um, monarchies and we uh, created slave states and we created peasantries and as we've become more and more technologically evolved we've become more and more isolated so we went from villages to to neighborhoods to individual nuclear family units to broken family units to what we're moving into right now, which is an era of the isolated individual. Currently, right, when we get out, when we go to school, we're separated away from every other generation, so we're only with our own generation, which means that we lose the ability to learn from an older generation or a younger generation, and we are kept in that kind of generational isolation throughout the entire commensary school process so that by the time that we're done, we haven't been able to garner that kind of wisdom anymore, and then we're quickly pushed onto a workforce, which is often very similar, and more and more what we're finding because technology allows us to all have only what we want when we want it we're finding ourselves incredibly isolated and even though we have more and more friends on facebook we have less and less friends in reality we have more and more (laughs) friends who live so far away that we can't just go visit them when i was a kid i remember i had friends in my neighborhood now my friends and i love my friends but they're all over the world and that's fantastic except that i can't just get together with them anymore yeah you know and we don't know the people on our street anymore and what's happened is the individual finds themselves more and more isolated so again we went from the diet that we were perfectly adapted to that kept us in perfect health a lifestyle that kept us in perfect health exercise they kept us in perfect health. We had perfectly healthy genetics in a perfectly clean environment with a truly warm, loving tribal structure. Today, we have adulterated all of that. And now we're at this place where we need a strategy to get through this because um, it is a truly becoming a dystopia for those people who don't have any answers. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's a lot, Daniel. <laughs> And um, 
for some of us out there, that's going to be brand new information, and it may seem pretty intense. But as you say, they, there are strategies out there, and that's kind of the work that you are all about. And I know that you use the elements as a kind of template for rewilding, and I think it's such a perfect and simple way to reference when thinking about strategies and ways to incorporate rewilding into our lives. So can you explain to us how you use the elements to illustrate rewilding and maybe go into a few easy tips that we can start doing straight away to help rewild our lives and, and foster maybe some more vitality for ourselves? Yeah, the good news is the, these strategies are really easy. They're very instinctive. Mm -hmm. And using the four elements, like you mentioned, using earth, water, air, and fire as a template, really what we're doing is we can use it as an accelerated learning system. So rather than having to, well, frankly, do what I did, which was spend, you know, half of my life trying to figure out what to do about everything we just talked about, um, I, I hear I'll give it to you in a very simple package. So it's really easy to um, make dramatic shifts in your lifestyle at the pace that you're comfortable with and in a way that you won't forget about it. So I think mm -hmm. we, oh, nobody's going to forget earth, water, air, fire. We, we can easily mm -hmm. remember that stuff. And that yeah. makes this a, a very easy system to learn. So here's rewilding in a uh, wild nutshell. Okay. <laughs> so earth, the earth element is a great way for us to think about the things that we eat. Because everything we eat rises up out of the soil or really truly out of the earth. You know, earth is a synonym for soil in many, in many cases. So we can think of earth as all those foods that we need to eat. The first thing to remember is that foods have to come from soil. Really, I think even before that we want to remember that everything we eat is a life form. We eat living things or things excreted by living things. It's easy to forget that because everything comes in styrofoam and cellophane where most people buy their mm -hmm. food. And I know that's probably not true for a lot of the listeners, but for a lot of the people the listeners know, food is abstract today, and it's only going to become mm -hmm. more abstract um, as we move forward. Now, luckily, there's been a renaissance in local food production, and this is great. This is good news for us. But keep in mind that you eat the cells of things that were alive before, or you eat things that those cells have excreted. For instance, honey or milk or something like that that is excreted by a living thing. But we eat basically life forms that spring up from the earth. Now, I think it's really helpful to think about four kingdoms of life that, are, are, that we eat from. Not everybody eats from all four kingdoms, but it's important to know about all four kingdoms. And I say that because there are people who, let's say, is maybe a vegetarian who doesn't eat from the kingdom of animals, but it's good to know that we do come from hunter-gatherers and that there is... Um, 200,000-year precedent of us eating animal foods and being in extremely good health. So I just want to put that out there. But we do consume, as a, as a people, as a species, four kingdoms of life. We eat from the animals, and those are the foods that we hunted. Now, today, those wild animals are not as available to us. So if we're going to eat from the kingdom of Animalia, we want to make sure that we eat animals that have been reared on their natural diets, and in most cases, that's going to mean grasses, because typically we eat ruminants. So it's very important to choose pastured animal foods. I think that's critical, and it's a way to ensure that the right balance of those fats that we talked about before are present, so we get those low inflammatory fats. Now, a replacement for eating animals, and what allowed India to be a, 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 a nation of vegetarians, was the consumption of dairy products which were a replacement for meats, and that's how they subsisted as vegetarians all that time. Again, if somebody chooses to eat dairy products because they don't have sens if they don't have sensitivities to them, then I would really suggest making sure, again, that you get grass-fed. And the further we go back in the genetics, in other words, if we look at the modern-day Holstein cow today, they produce a very inflammatory milk, but we see that we can find less inflammatory milks from Jersey cows. Just put that out there. Um, uh, eggs the same way. Pastured are always going to be better. 
Now, we need to eat plants as well. We eat from the plant kingdom. So we want to make sure that the plants we eat are organically raised. And if we can, we want to find heirloom varieties of plants. And the best place to do that is at your local farmer's market or to grow them yourself. If you're going to buy these things in a store, you want to choose organic. And that is in the tr- that is one of the best things you can do for yourself and your family. Um, keep in mind that we also eat from the fungi family. And it's very valuable to look at these medicinally powerful mushrooms mushrooms, many of which can now be bought in our supermarkets, and if you get the right kind of education, you don't do this randomly, but the right kind of education, you can harvest these yourself in nature. Mushrooms have a powerful adaptogenic and anti-cancer effects, and we used to eat them, and we have a lot less than our diet today, so they can be very valuable to us. And the, the fourth, but maybe the most important, is the, the kingdom of microbiota, or microorganisms, and when I say that, what I mean is we used to eat a lot of fermented food, foods that we actually fed first to microbes, and then we ate those microbes' bodies. Um, in, an example would be sauerkraut. We take a perfectly good cabbage, we let it ferment and be eaten by, by microbes, and then we eat that stuff. And that stuff fills our bodies, our intestinal lumen, with those microbes that work as a kind of defense force for us, a kind of immune system for us, keeping us very healthy. For some people, their fermented food might be kombucha. Others, it may be yogurts. Others, it may be kefirs. Um, Many to choose from and more and more available to us now. So earth, I want you to think four kingdoms of life. And when you choose from those kingdoms, you choose the healthiest versions of everything that you can. That's critical. The next element is water. Um... All water is not created equal, and I want people to know that, that it's easy to think all water is the same thing, but interestingly, all waters are sort of different, and the best waters for us are natural living waters, like spring waters. So I just want to plug quickly my website, a free website that you can use, findaspring.com, which is a database of springs, and that will lead you to a spring in your area where if you wanted to, you could go and fill up bottles with living, natural, clean water from aquifers from deep below the earth. You simply roll up to a pipe that's stuck in a spring. That water flows out perfectly clean, and it's not contaminated with all of the contaminants that our surface waters around the world are contaminated with. If you don't have access to that, another great water would be water from deep drilled wells, That water that you may have in your home or someone you know may have in their home, that water comes from aquifers. It's not been treated with chlorine. It's not been treated with fluoride. It's not been treated with phosphoric acid or sodium hydroxide or any other numerous things that ends up in our water supply today. If you Mm -hmm. must filter your water... Um, please visit my website and check out uh, on DanielVitalis.com. I have an article on demineralized water and learn some strategies to remineralize your water because it's very important that we don't strip our water of nutrients and often filters, whilst they remove a lot of the bad stuff, remove a lot of the good stuff and create a kind of water that's maybe not really healthy for us. Um, The next piece will be air. And remember that human beings today spend 99% of their time indoors Oh my gosh, that's a lot. And <laughs> the, that's a lot. It is a lot. And the air indoors is always more polluted than the air outside, even if you live in a place where there's a lot of air pollution. So you might think, well, I'm in L.A., I'll close the windows up because the air out there is really bad. Well, the air out there is the air that's inside too, except the air inside <laughs> has no ions in it and is locked up with all of the outgassing furniture and flooring and cabinetry and, and countertops. We need to be very conscientious about the things we bring in our homes because the stuff we bring in our homes typically has been manufactured using some of these um, 85,000 chemicals I mentioned earlier, and a lot of them are volatile, and they, they outgas into the air, and we breathe that. Now, one quick strategy, houseplants eat toxic chemicals out of the air. This was proven in a fantastic study by NASA. Looking, you know, NASA Mm -hmm. had to figure out if we're going to put these astronauts up in space inside these sealed containers full of plastic, how are we going to keep them from being super sick from all of these outgassing chemicals? And they figured out that plants eat chemicals out of the air. So that's really important. Another piece will be having a HEPA filter in your home. It's tremendously valuable uh, for removing particulate from the air. HEPA just means high-efficiency particulate air filter. And what it does is it pulls out little particles, stuff that plants can't eat, little chunks of stuff. Particularly, it pulls out dust. And remember, dust is dead skin. And dead skin is fed upon by mites. 
So what's floating in our air is lots of dead skin with mites on it that we inhale and <laughs> breathe and filter into our lungs. And this did not happen for indigenous people. Why? Because they didn't seal themselves inside buildings. So their dead mm-hmm. skin went into the ecosystem and was decomposed. Ours is trapped in our house and we breathe it. So we want to basically keep the air as clean as we can. If you have plants and HEPA, and at one HEPA filter that you can move around your home, you can keep your air really clean. And the major important thing is keeping your windows open as much as possible because you want to be getting that fresh air in. Fresh air is not just like some sort of random statement. It refers to the ions that are in the air, and that's an electrical property. Air should have ions in it. You can buy ion generators if you live in a place where you really can't get good fresh air into the house. Get an ion generator. That will help to improve the air quality. And as much as possible, we want to be getting time outside. Walks in nature are a great way for us to get fresh air, particularly in forests at beaches, near waterfalls or moving water, that's where some of the best air is going to be. The last piece of these four elements is going to be fire. And when I say fire, I'm really talking about the fire of the furnace of the sun. So the sun Mm. is a massive fire. It's a hydrogen furnace. And that fire is emitting electromagnetic radiation, which comes down here to Earth. And guess what? We're adapted to it. So if we get around other forms of electromagnetic radiation, we're usually not adapted to it. And so the kind that maybe comes from our our televisions, our computers, our phones, our Wi-Fi, that's a kind of electromagnetic radiation we're not adapted to because it's brand new. And we are adapted to the kind of electromagnetic radiation that comes from the sun because we've had millions of years of evolution to adapt to and actually rely on it. Now, what we're told, strangely is avoid the sun and stay inside around all these machines. (laughs) And the machines become almost a surrogate sun because they also emit light and radiation, but not in the frequencies and not in the um, color bands that that we rely on for health. So I'm not saying that you should stay outside all the time in the sun without any protection from the sun, but I do think it's really important that we get some noonday sun on as much bare skin as possible If you are a very fair-complected person, you need less. If you're a darkly-complected person, you definitely need more. We rely on it to create the master key hormone of all health, and that's vitamin D, critical to nearly every process in our body at some level. And um, Mm -hmm. people are incredibly deficient in vitamin D. But we also rely on the sun for other things as well, particularly the, the... the regulation of our circadian rhythm, of our excretion from the pineal gland of serotonin and melatonin. These are our mood regulators and our sleep cycle regulators. When people become troglodytes, cave dwellers, they remove themselves from the sun, it throws their serotonin into uh, sort of out of balance. And those people very often end up not feeling good. And you know, one of the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency, by the way, is osteomalacia, which means bone pain. So what you end up with is a person with a deep, aching, painful body experience and a very depressed mood state. And those people become prime candidates for pharmaceutical, psychoactive, psychotropic drugging. Um, Mm -hmm. And interestingly, what they actually needed was, it's, it's almost so perfectly metaphorical that it's absurd, what they needed was to experience to to step into the light. They Mm. needed enlightenment. They needed to go back to the source. They needed to look at the Son of God. However you want to say that, they, you know, we we remove ourselves from the source. We hide from it in the darkness when all health comes from that great source of light. So in a nutshell, a simple, simple, we'll say a Brazilian nutshell because Brazil nuts are a wild, uncultivated, undomesticated food. Um, So in a Brazil (laughs) nutshell... What we want to be doing is is starting to look at four things. What's the earth, the food that we eat? What's the water, the water we drink? What's the air, the air that we breathe? And what's the fire, the light that we're exposed to? Think about the average American right now. They're eating genetically modified and cloned foods. Yes, I said cloned foods. Most of the fruits people eat are clones. They eat genetically modified cloned foods. They drink chemically laden treated dead water. They breathe dead, recycled, conditioned air, and the only true light source that they're in front of is their iPhone. How healthy could they be? What if we Mm. took a wild chimpanzee and we made them live under those conditions? How long until they would have cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and arthritis? Probably not Mm -hmm. that long. 
Why would we expect something different from ourselves? So guess what? Rewilding yourself is not um, you saying goodbye to your family and heading off to the savanna to live like yeah. a chimpanzee. It's you <laughs> living a beautiful modern life but being incredibly discerning about the choices that you make for yourself and your family and approximating some of those things that we used to have in our life and bringing them back in a way that feels sustainable and healthy for you so that you can enjoy some of your ancestral health, which, I mean, really, honestly, and if you look at the research on this, you'll see was a kind of health that we rarely see today. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, it's a very enjoyable thing to do, and it's, it's all available to you right outside your door. And I know for myself, I've always sort of looked to nature if I'm pondering a question about what to eat or um, what my body needs. If you just look at an animal and you just look outside your door, it's all there for you. What's available? What's there? The sun is there. The clean air is there. The the plants are there. And, and in what form are they available? And uh, we enjoy being outside so much and have to go on these sort of packaged holidays to get that time. Um, so there is that disconnection, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we don't have to go far. We can just go into our backyards, and hopefully okay. we have one. And if we don't, then we can go to a city park and really try and enjoy that and participate in it and not um, just be there and snap our photos and leave. But, but get in, back in communication with nature and touch it and breathe it and... You know, I like to say roll around in it. <laughs> um, it and that well-being that that. You, you remind me of the the story of the Wizard of Oz. You know, I, I've always thought it was a really interesting story because each of the characters, to me, represents one of the elements. And um, we see, like, that Dorothy represents Earth. She's looking for home. She's looking to be grounded again. She's looking for Earth. The scarecrow represents the mind, and that's always been associated with air. Air is thought and communication. Mm. And we see the uh, tin man who's afraid of water, but that's because he's, he's looking for emotion, and he's looking to be able to cry again, so he's looking for water. And we see this lion who's looking for the fire of courage, and the story is that it's always been in your backyard the whole time, um, mm. and that you have to go searching for it. And um, what I think that we, we all sense this stuff that we're talking about today. We all sense it, and it emerges in our arts, and it emerges in our storytelling, and it emerges culturally. But very few of us have been able to interpret it because, again, we, we've lived very isolated from wisdom. And, um, and the good news is, is that every action of your ancestors is embedded within you, right, in your genetics. And mm -hmm. you have access to that information again, but we've got to turn the noise down a little bit to find it. And we've got to get coherent. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, there's a tremendous push for distraction right now. And the biggest thing that can distract us right now is that we are we have access to a little pleasure button. You know, we're like a monkey in an experiment. Push the red button, get a little pleasure dopamine rush. We have access mm -hmm. to you know, technologies that can and drugs that can make us feel any way we want to feel at any moment. And that's new and that's distracting and it's like a kind of noise. So we have to, like you said in the beginning of this call, it's not that we're saying, hey, you got to stay unplugged all the time. It's we got to we got to relish those moments of, of quiet when we can mm -hmm. let wisdom emerge. We don't have to think about it. It emerges. And like you said, in nature, the answer to your query emerges. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Daniel, this is amazing information you've shared with us, and we have had the honor of developing Be Wild, a rewilding body enlightenment course with all of your core teachings. If some of our listeners out there would like to go a bit deeper into the rewilding journey, can you just give us a very quick look into the kinds of things they can expect to learn by taking Be Wild. You know, really, it's been exciting to put that course together with you because so many interviews I do end up being, I think the listener can probably tell I'm, I'm ultra-compressing data to fit it into this segment of time. And 
um, the listener hears it and walks away um, and only hears it that one time. And mm-hmm. I'm excited to get to unzip the file um, of information and over a course of time so that that information uh, is like a seed that we plant and then we water together over the course of weeks so that it grows um, and is nurtured and nourished as it grows rather than um, sometimes I feel like I throw a seed and then I have to run over somewhere else and throw another seed and I don't often get to nourish them. So what can be expected is that we'll start to really flush this information out and we'll explore not just the um, real intellectual parts of it but some of the psychological and emotional parts of it as well, which are really crucial. Um, And we're going to look at not just how this affects us, but how it affects our families and our relationships and how we move emotionally in the world. So it's going to be a very dynamic course. Um, and I, my hope and my intention is that the person who is part of that course walks away with a lifetime's uh, – it's an accelerated learning process. And I expect that everybody will walk away with something that will – continue to work for them forever so that from the moment they're immersed in that information, the rest of their lives, it continues to unfold and becomes theirs. And they don't have to have, I mean, I think the most unfortunate thing is how difficult it is for people to sort through all of the health information that's out there. So I want to um, basically empower people on how to look at that information so that they know truth from fiction very quickly can sort through information very quickly and have that accelerated learning package so that they can organize information that they learn very quickly. So um, essentially, I want to give those people who are part of it a a true crash course in human self-health care maintenance. And and we've got a course that I think can do that. Awesome. I'm so excited for that course. (laughs) It's going to be great. And people can also learn more about you and your work at danielvitalis.com, findthespring.com, and surthrival.com. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Just that um, those answers are inside you. I really believe that, and, and that's permeated my work. And I feel that, you know, the stuff we talked about today... I didn't have to search the world to find it. I found it in myself, and I know that this information resides in you too, and if you feel a kinship with it, I um, hope to see you on the course. Hmm. And the answers are also outside your door, but <laughs> nature is inside us. You know, it's not separate from us. We are nature. And I, I have a beautiful call with um, his name is Kenton Whitman, and we go deeper sort of into that journey of, of how we are intertwined and we are nature. And uh, I think that's really integral in this journey that we don't need to, like I said in the introduction, look for the next quick fix that's going to put a Band-Aid on our ouchies. You know? <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's been always been there. And, and just the way that you feel when you walk in a forest or go to your cottage by the lake is is a window into a whole world of, of vitality and wellness that's just waiting and sitting quietly there for you. I couldn't agree more. So there's just one last question I'd love to ask you before we can let you go, Daniel. Okay. This is still under the Wish Summit, so I'd love to ask you what your wild wish is for the people listening to this call? Hmm. My wild wish, my wild wish is that the truth would have its day Uh, because I feel like I live in a world that has become, is, is under a kind of spell and under a kind of hypnosis and I spent my life finding other people who are not susceptible to that hypnosis or who come easily out of that hypnosis. And I think my wish for myself, but also for all those people, is um, that we get to see the truth have its day and um, that we see 
all of these things that we know are possible, that we feel are possible, that we experience, and and we know they work. I, I just uh, my wish is to see those things employed, and to to not have to um, fight and struggle to see those things happen on a small scale, but to see them happen on a large scale. And and I don't know how to make that happen, but I know how to share my truth, and so many other people are sharing their truth. So my wild wish is for all of that to to finally hit that that tipping point where where truth really really has its day and all things are revealed. Hear, hear. And thank you so much for sharing your truth with us. It is always such a pleasure to listen to you speak. I could do it for days. Um so yes, thank you so much Daniel for your time and your wisdom. We've really enjoyed having you again. Thank you so much for uh, giving me a place to share. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wish Radio. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can access lots more inspiring interviews at wishradio.com. But if you're ready to roll up your sleeves and take action, then tap, type, or swipe your way to tirawarner.com. There you'll find safe, simple solutions to detox your home, body, and heart from the confusions that make life unnecessarily difficult. We offer lots of amazing free programs to our subscribers all year long. All you have to do is sign up and you'll be the first to hear about it. I hope we'll meet again. And until then, don't change yourself to please the world. Be yourself, because that is what changes the world.